Chapter 1. Disquieting Tidings. Part 2. Once they were gone, Oaken's gaze drifted to the facing wall, where a flag display of ten tidings of the twill surrounded a large map of the area. The remaining councillors were engrossed in pensive reflection. In a few moments he broke the silence. Well, my good folk of the twill, I think that rests in able hands, and we all remaining here have a task before us too. Clay, you speak with the farmers, impart to them the gravity of the situation, but not in a way that would daunt anyone. Let all the work carry on as usual, but be more vigilant. If anything strange is seen or heard, tell them to report it immediately. Otherwise, continue with the harvest. Nothing must delay it if possible. Glenn, you likewise notify your Ferndale folk. Put it carefully as well, so as not to alarm anyone unduly. Your daughters, of course, may remain here, if you and they so desire. And you know that here they will be as safe as anywhere. Speak with them after the meeting. General Stonewash, he addressed the man with a flourishing moustache, who seemed a little nervous. Get together with Captain Briar and Lieutenant Blackthorne. Mull over some strategies. Oaken turned to the wall behind him, to a collection of canvases above the wainscot, where the likenesses of famous ancestors and other distinguished personages were competing in their grandeur and he faced a portrait of a formidable-looking character with a gigantic handlebar moustache. Pity that Admiral Plantain is on his travels again, we certainly could have done with his expertise. Aladdin, he said to a counsellor with a mild countenance in a long blue-green raiment, inform our sooner pedal heart and stock up on your remedies. We know not what we are dealing with here, just use your judgment. Min Green, prepare a report on wherewithal. Elowin, I shall have a word with you in a moment. And you, my dear, he turned to his forlorn-looking daughter, are in charge of the Hollybury estate, our guests and employees. The meeting was over, and Lord Oaken remained at the oval table in the council chamber. Only two other members were still present. Elowin, said Oaken to his scribe, this is to be between us. Assist my daughter, and make sure that she is challenged enough without being overwhelmed. I think it is best for her to keep busy. She appears to be in a rather fragile frame of mind. It is all happening at once. How oh, I wish sometimes her mother was here, but I must not be unfair to Molly D. She has been a real treasure all these years. Will you do as I ask, Alawin? Not to word to her, though, about my worries. It shall be just as you wish, sir, the scribe answered dreamily. He stood up and sighed something he had grown to do more than usual of late. He was on his way out when Oaken had picked up the little golden bell again, and as it rang, the butler materialized at the door. He had just finished tying an elaborate bow at the hem of his breeches, and was rather pleased at this improvement. Cleavis said Lord Oaken, I want you to find Jack by the hedge. I have an errand for him. Send him to the south finger of the twill to see if the floating cabin is in sight, and immediately raise the yellow flag. Then saddle my horse and inform me when all is ready. Cleavus bowed and left. Lord Oaken filled the silver goblet with water and took it to the window, and imbibing it he gazed at the majestic landscape spread before his eyes. Right opposite the Hollybury estate, on the other side of the river Twill, the conical birch hill with the ring of stands and stones on its summit dominated the view. Rising high above the Vale of Twill, it was surrounded by the Silon Twill meadows, which were met by the broad meads stretching to the horizon, until the bay south was barred by the soaring into the clouds, craggy peaks of the Dragonstale mountain range. Glen Moss joined him at the window. Oaken, he said, in view of what our future might hold, some things that were important only a short while ago now seem petty and irrelevant. Dear Glen, said Oaken, Indeed, our perceptions alter as the circumstances change, but some things, like family, are always important. Was it that what was on your mind? Is it Ivy again? I hope you're not being too hard on her. You know she must be missing Lilybell very much. Her attention must be drawn to the fact that Ogan's hope of Glenn not being too hard on Ivy was totally unnecessary, for he was well aware that Glenn was a most loving and devoted husband. But it was in Ogan's nature to be protective. So Glenn let it pass. Also Glenn had neglected to point out that it was Oaken himself who was partly responsible for Ivy's current state of ennui. 
Ogun said he. This is not the whole problem. Even though it would be a falsehood not to admit that she has been more moody since Lily Bell left, it is not just that. She had a clash with the brambles. Indeed, an incident had transpired earlier in the day which was the cause of Glenn's late arrival, and this is what happened. The Bramble family, after they had been feasting on juicy black brimbleberries on the bank of the brook, were on their daily rounds visiting friends. And they specifically wanted to call on Chanterelle to share with her the fruit of their delectable harvest. And when they were right outside the Honeysuckle Lodge, they came upon a surprise. A veritable fungal cornucopia which had sprung up overnight. Forsooth, what a whopping clump of honeycap mushrooms, cried Pip. And indeed, whopping it was, and as this sort of mushrooms was one of their favourites, they attacked it with glee. And to be sure, with such supply, there would be plenty to pickle and to dry, and enough to make delicious soups and pies with for nearly half the winter. At that exact moment, Ivy, afflicted with boredom and feeling dull and dreary, was revelling in cloying tedium, and needless to say, the arrival was most unwelcome. It was not that she would object to them having the mushrooms, but the thing was that the brambles were not the quietest of folk. What, with the four hee-hawing donkeys, the two loudly chattering children, and Thorn vociferating with gusto? Sticks and bristles! Every now and then, precisely underneath Ivy's boudoir window, very noisy lot they were, and the tremendous racket that they were making was just too much to bear for her delicate nerves. Her lamentation thus disrupted, she was going to call Chanterelle, hoping she would persuade them to move on. But then she saw her maid outside, chatting with Barry Bramble. I had no choice. She came out and, staring with horror at their blackberry-stained hands, requested them to leave. But Thorne had the impertinence to contradict her, saying that according to the woodland law, all the Ferndale inhabitants had rights to pick berries or mushrooms anywhere in the Ferndale. Although Ivy knew that to be true, she replied irritably. Well, do it anywhere, but not here. Thorn's wife very called them to leave. But as they were going, their children did something which wounded Ivy's pride to the core and deeply injured her dignity. So when the first opportunity had availed itself, she complained to her husband. And do you know what those impudent pips done did? They turned around and stuck out their tongues at me. And Glen, they had purple tongues. What kind of a person would have a purple tongue? I am sure no self-respecting person would have a purple tongue. Ivy had no doubts that Glen would join her in the indignation, but contrary to her expectations, she was discomposed further still, and instead of being consoled, was plunged even deeper into disappointment upon being reminded that first the brambles did have a right to pick fruit or mushrooms anywhere they wanted. And second, that it was their choice to have whatever colour of tongues, or anything else for that matter, and that she must not judge folk on the colour of their tongue. And if that was not enough, Glenn proceeded to divulge something from his past, something which was of such a disturbing nature that Ivy would not have believed it had it not come from her own Glenn himself. As it happens, my darling, he said, smiling, in my youth, I also was in the habit of frequenting the hedges, and on those occasions, exactly the same shade of purple was smeared all around my joyful visage. Upon hearing his confession, poor Ivy was quite beside herself. Oh, no, Glenn, she cried, but how shocking! I do not understand how you can be smiling so, and I entreat you, please never reveal this to anyone for my sake, if you do not care what others might think. You would not do it now, would you? Remember, you're a sir. Your grandfather was knighted by the Queen Violet herself. You, of all people, should know how unbecoming it is to possess a purple tongue. Ivy had wound herself up to such an extent that her trepidation was bordering on panic. What if it got out? She could not bear a thought of this secret escape into the censure of the world. Oh no, imagine what they would say. Sir Glenn Moss has a purple tongue. Although Glenn was not overly concerned with the likelihood of his grandfather's or indeed anyone else's disapproval, he listened on patiently, not even trying to stem the flow of Ivy's frightful conjectures. 
and she happily continued on soliloquizing in the same manner, until at length the subject was exhausted, and she concluded it with emphatic, and very beginnings for the rustics. All that perturbation had left Ivy feeling depressed and deflated and in desperate need of cheering up. And as nothing worked so well in dispelling the gloom as the theme of her famous relations, the monologue progressed accordingly. Those folk that have no idea of who I am and that I have very important and famous connections. And so she indulged in extolling the virtues of her eminent family. However, her knowledge of them, having come from somewhat vague sources, was sparse and with no means of verification. And not only was she not in a position to boast having the pleasure of their illustrious acquaintance, but in fact she had never even laid her beautiful emerald green eyes upon them, and if truth be told, being ignorant of their identity and whereabouts, she secretly doubted their very existence. Glenn, although never having expressed it to her, privately had the same suspicions, and now he shared them with Oaken. To be honest, Oaken, I am not even sure that they really exist. Dear Glenn, but they do exist. In the faraway land, on the other side of the world, her relations happen to be powerful therapeutics and greatly sought after, but neither that nor anything can justify looking down on our neighbours. It would be nice if she came down to earth a little bit. Having said that, you know my high regard for her, and I would be delighted to see her again soon. Why do you not invite her to join us here on the morrow? I do not think she would come, and do you know why? Because she objects to having to wade Uncle Deep in Mud through the farmyard and speak with the folk with whom she says she has nothing in common. Perhaps one day she will change. People do, you know. But whether she comes or not, you are not living without some of our choicest grapes our Ivy is so fond of. Yes, she is also fond of fermented grape juice. Indeed, as I am, and that is why I will instruct Cleavers to put a bottle of our finest claret into your coracle together with a basket of grapes. Oaken went back to the table and was just about to pick up the little golden bell, but was preceded by a knock on the door, and Cleavers, his breeches arrayed with showy bows, stepped in. He was followed by a toddling gosling, whom he picked up and said, Everything is ready, sir. The flag is raised, your horse is saddled and waiting for you in the western vault. He then glanced at the grey baby bird and explained, The moment he had hatched, he saw me first, and now thinks that I'm his mamma. Oaken smiled. Then he looked at the map on the facing wall, where the loopy marshes were indicated in light green colour in the east, and heavy sank his heart. Loath I to bring ill tidings to such a gentle folk, he said gravely, and then approached Glen Moss again. I shall depart in a moment, my dear friend. I hope your domestic situation will take a turn for the better soon. Please give my compliments to Ivy. I am off to the loopy marshes. He clasped Glenn's shoulder and briskly strode out of the council chamber.